So let me welcome everyone to this uh, student and staff faculty informational forum uh, involving the coronavirus. Uh, as many of you know by now, uh, there is very little that's talked about every day on the news, every day in the community, every day in classes, uh, like this virus. Uh, just very recently, the NCAA uh, had thought that they would go on the tournament. Uh, they just would not have people act that they fight those games. Uh, they since uh, scrapped that, and now the NCAA, NCAA tournament uh, is over with. Uh, and that was, of course, March Madness. So there won't be a March Madness. But there is a March Madness. It's just not in the form of athletics. Uh, it is now in the form of a virus, something that has uh, caught the attention of almost everybody. Uh, there was a discussion in the hallway at our school here on this campus not long ago, which uh, prompted this uh, forum that two professors were discussing uh, the virus and other types of diseases and things are spread. which led us need to believe, but standing there listening to them, uh, that there's a difference in what viruses do and how they work and who's impacted. Uh, and so uh, we decided that we would put together a forum and bring uh, some experts uh, who have dealt with these types of things, uh, who know these types of things. And so we thought it would be better uh, to have a forum as opposed to have people try to get information from Wikipedia or Facebook. Uh, which is common where most people are getting their information from. And so, uh, social and behavioral science is in conjunction with uh, uh, the Santana, as it does, the Central Arizona College, decided we would put together this forum. And I want to now introduce uh, the panel of very, very distinguished guests. I'm going to run this way. I'll introduce our guests. Uh, they will take about 10 minutes to talk about their profession and talk about uh, this virus uh, uh, in particular. Uh, we won't hold them to 10 minutes uh, because all of them are going to have to do so this over that time. That's perfectly fine. Uh, and after which, uh, I have a couple of questions that are some general questions that people are raising. And then after that, we're going to turn it over to you. And I'm sure that you come uh, not only here, but you uh, may have some questions as well. And so this forum is exactly that. Uh, if you ask these professionals the questions about this virus uh, so that you can understand it, and particularly as we head into spring break. Uh, first time this is Dr. Franklin Leroy, He's a medical doctor. Uh, he wanted me to let you know that he is uh, the husband of Professor Liz Leroy, uh, who teaches social, uh, psychology. Social and Behavioral Sciences. Dr. Baroy has 36 years of medical experience. He's been a doctor for 36 years, 26 years here at Pennell County. And so I will, uh, we want to welcome you, uh, Dr. Baroy. Uh, Dr. 
Dr. Michael J. Ewell uh, is the former director of microbiology at the Mount Sinai Medical and Technical Research Coordinator for Pediatric Center for Drug uh, Research in Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital at University Hospitals of Cleveland. Uh, um, Dr. Ewell also has a great deal of experience in infectious disease research, and so we thought it was very important uh, to have him be a part of our panel, and we want to welcome you also, Dr. Ewell. Professor John Faust is a professor of administration of justice in the social and behavioral sciences. Uh, he comes to us uh, having served in the Metropolitan Police Department of Washington, D.C. Uh, he uh, also has been involved in uh, teaching since 1977 in New Mexico. And uh, uh, one of the more interesting things about, in addition to all of those interesting things about him, He's also had a great deal of work in the pandemic planning, and that was the most important uh, reason for having him on this panel, because uh, when we first put this panel together, there were those who were asking, well, why are you inviting somebody in pandemic planning? Aren't you creating hysteria? And why should, why should you want to be here that's, that's engaged in pandemic planning? And then two days ago, the World Health Organization answered that question and now declared the coronavirus as a pandemic. Uh, so John Faust's presence here is very important, as we thought it would be. Welcome, John Faust. So we'll start, Dr. Boyd, with you, if you would just open up and tell us a little bit about you and the practice and what you're seeing in Pinell County and all as it relates to this virus. Okay. I'm Dr. Boyd. I'm a family practitioner. Um, Currently, he's just still practicing, but really slowed down the uh, amount of patients I see per day. As a matter of fact, I just had two patients this afternoon, even though I wasn't supposed to see anyone. But uh, that's family practice. Uh, as long as you're a doctor, people will knock on your door and I'm like, okay, fine, come on in. I've got to be out of here by 1.45 because I've got to meet Dr. Span. Sad hand and said, Who's that? I'm like, Don't worry about it. I have an appointment. You've got to be there at 2 30. Well, I didn't make it at 2 30. Made it here at 2 45. So I apologize, sir. Uh, but the traffic was a little heavy. But that's all right. Family doctors, we see more infections than an infectious disease doctor, right? What is an infectious disease doctor? Well, they specialize in any and all types of infections of the human body. Whether it's viral, whether it's from a bacteria, whether it's from a parasite, whatever it is, that's their specialty. But we primary care docs are first to see our neighbors, our patients, people in our community, whether there are patients or not, they walk in and say, I need to see a doctor today. I have a sore throat, I have a runny nose, I have fever, I need to see a doctor. Can I see a doctor today? I'm like, I am fully booked, but I'll see you anyway. I'll squeeze you in. That's what a primary care doctor does. After we have seen the patient and said, you know what? This is a little unusual. As a matter of fact, maybe a little too severe than what a primary care doctor should be taking care of. Or perhaps the patient was given a prescription, like, okay, fine, don't give me some moxicillin that works or not, not come on back and I'll see you. Well, I thought, you know what? I think I did not particularly do a good job of getting a right diagnosis. Maybe we needed a blood test, and we needed whatever test needed. I think I need to consult with an infectious disease doctor. And they then do the further studies and the more aggressive treatments that a patient needs. So we see a lot of different types of infections in our offices. Now, thankfully, we haven't seen any, um, at least this season, patients with um, severe viral infections. Coronavirus is a SARS virus. Anybody remember what SARS virus was? Nasty. We were scared. We were afraid that 
It's going to be coming our way rather quickly and aggressively, and by golly, I have no antibiotic to offer my patients. We were scared. We were really scared. Fortunately, it kind of fizzled out rather quickly. And I'm going to use that term because we understand that word. It did. The virus kind of self-destroyed itself. In other words, it wasn't able to gather the momentum that this type of SARS virus, the coronavirus, is a type of SARS virus. It's a respiratory virus, okay? I'm not using my one point, though. My wife is, is a professor, okay? I don't do that kind of stuff. I practice medicine. So I, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking. And if my wife asks me, did you use those PowerPoints? I'll say, yes, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so what is coronavirus? It's a virus that's very similar to a SARS virus. It's a respiratory virus. So if I do this, and then I did that, let's say half hour ago, don't do what I just did, okay? I just demonstrated to you. Now what I should do is I should go to a bathroom and wash my hands because maybe 30 minutes ago, maybe 45 minutes ago, maybe two hours ago, someone who touched the surface may have had a nasty coronavirus. Let's suppose they did, or SARS virus, or even influenza virus. And then I just remembered that my forehead is scratching and itching and I'm just scratching my forehead. Guess what I did? I just infected myself from the virus that was here. And not intentionally, but unintentionally, accidentally. I did this wrong. I shouldn't do that. Why? Because I know better. Well, let's say that I didn't know better, and I did, and what happens? Whatever virus that was here, that was, let's so assume it's a SARS corona, SARS virus, and I now touch my face. Now what happened? The virus is now really close to where? Close to my nostrils. Close to my eyes. It's close to my mouth. That's where I'm going to acquire the virus. It has an opening. It has a portal to my nose, to my mouth, to my eyes. Those are mucous membranes through which we can acquire these viruses. Now let's say I love um, Mexican food, and I went to see Jose's restaurant, and there I had really wonderful tacos, and I had lots of burritos, and I had food that wasn't properly cooked. Jose's regular chef isn't there, but somebody else did. It was not properly cooked. Now, that substance the bacteria that was unprepared was not was in an unprepared dish or not well cooked is not a respiratory virus. It goes through the oral route, but it's not a respiratory virus because it's not a virus, it's a bacteria. Do virus and bacteria behave similarly? To a point. Bacteria has limits of where it can enter. A virus really does not have too many barriers. It can go wherever it wants to. But thankfully, this particular type of virus likes a respiratory system. It doesn't seem to affect our gastrointestinal system. So it doesn't go my stomach and infect my stomach. It doesn't affect my intestines and colon like other bacteria can. So that's the difference between viruses and bacteria. Besides, bacteria I can see in a microscope. Viruses are so, so small. I need a very highly specialized type of device to see a, a, a virus. They're very small. Viruses can live on top of a bacteria. It can infect a bacteria. That's how small a virus can be. This is a respiratory virus. It likes the respiratory system. What does it do? It attacks, it attaches itself to my nostril, to my mouth, and it slowly moves down the respiratory tract, even though it can go anywhere else, but that's where it likes to go most, into my nostril, my sinus cavities, the bronchioles, and then into the lungs. This particular virus loves to produce high fever, not just low-grade fever. It produces significant fever. Why? Because our body is fighting 
against this particular virus. It doesn't know it's an enemy. So we produce fever as a reaction to an infection. Okay? If I cannot produce fever to an infection, my immune system is almost none. Probably completely zero. I should be able to produce fever against an onset, an onslaught of this virus. That's what happens with coronavirus and SARS viruses. It produces a fever. And then it really it irritates our respiratory tract. So coughing becomes a, a really major problem with this virus. Let's compare it to a flu virus, okay? Flu viruses are similar, but they like the respiratory system. But boy, does it like to make my nose run. It's itchy. My eyes get irritated. My nostrils are just boggy full, I'm trying to blow my nose, and it just, just, ooh, yucky. And it can cause greenish color, it can cause yellow color, and sometimes bloody mucus membranes. But it likes that. Cough becomes a secondary problem, not like SARS viruses. They like to go directly to the bronchial and lung. Cough is a major problem, and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse, to the point where it spasms in our bronchioles and lungs are so severe that I develop shortness of breath. I can't get it. Otherwise, I'm coughing so much. Then it becomes so severe that I'm not getting enough oxygen on board, enough so that I can faint and fall over dead because there's no one around. Let's say I was alone at home. I'm coughing so much that I don't even have time to reach for my phone. I'm so weak. I become disoriented. I don't I guess there's not enough oxygen on board. That's why this virus is so lethal that it goes so quickly into our body within 24 to 48 hours. It is really kicking flat. It's awful. It's horrible. Whereas flu viruses take longer to incubate. The word incubate meaning it needs to germinate. Okay? It needs to duplicate. It needs to make to one, into 50, to million, to 10 million, okay? Whereas bacteria do multiply, but they multiply slower. Viruses can multiply much more rapidly. And this particular virus multiplies very, very rapidly. It affects our immune system. It paralyzes our immune system very, very quickly. Unusual. Remember, we haven't had time to study this thing very much, very long. That's what I thought. There's a very smart man in Texas who's been studying it for four years. He didn't have the live virus to study, but he's been studying the SARS virus, thinking coronaviruses are similar. He identified it four years ago. He ran out of money, no one funded it, he closed the books. Very smart man. Where is he at? In Texas. Go Texas. All right? There are other specialists, scientists around the country in America that are very much active, working 24 hours a day, trying to find out more about how this virus behaves. If we can't find out how this virus behaves, we can't find a cure. So we've got to find out how does it behave. We have a lot of question about, and I've been watching the news like you all have, where am I going to get the test kit? You're not. Even I, as a doctor, cannot get a test kit. It's available in two labs here in Pinal County, America County, through LabCorp and Sonora Quest. LabCorp had the labs, the test kits a week ago. Sonora Quest just acquired them this week. I know that because I get emails, okay? Say so we have the kit. So the doctor will send you to the lab, they will draw, what, not blood, they will stick a stick up the nose. We need to get the specimen from back way up high in the trigger, in very small caverns up there, They'd like a eye up there, and the throat. So they will do two swabs. Other bacterial infections, I will do a blood test because I can find out whether it's in blood or not. Not this 
doggone virus. It likes to selectively stay in the respiratory system. So those are the swabs they're going to do, and they send it to a centralized area where they can test for this virus. And then it was to say, yeah, you can in, in Korea, you can walk up and get a test kit, just like you go to McDonald's and you pick it up and you go home and do it. As a doctor, I find that distressing because you can do it wrongly, perform the test in a wrong manner and get a false negative test, even though you may have the test, I may mean, have the virus. So therefore, I think it should be done by a specialized person who knows how to perform that procedure correctly. Number two, CDC just announced to us that the first batch of testing that was sent out wasn't working well. So they sent a second batch. There are a lot of complaints about that. I'm sorry, medicine isn't perfect. I will be the first to tell you as a 36 year old practitioner, I make mistakes because I'm a human being. The medications that I have are not perfect. The testing that I have available to me, they're not perfect. But we're doing our best, people. That's all we can do as physicians, nurses, specialists, trying to find out the best method of detecting this virus and detecting it accurately. Okay. Right. Am I? Your right there. I want to get in uh, Dr. Duell uh, to okay. add on to this, and then we'll be right back on okay. this. And all of them have great information, and I have the uh, um, terrible job of trying to interrupt and, and um, but because all of this is very, very good information. So I'm going to give you all as much time as I can. I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to take this from a more academic standpoint. Uh, and I need to rearrange some of the information that Dr. Broy just gave you. Uh, the overarching virus is called a coronavirus. This is a family of viruses. Uh, there are many types of them. They affect animals as well as humans. A limited number of them affect humans. Uh, in the past, we thought of coronaviruses causing only two problems with humans. One was the common cold. There is a strain of coronavirus that causes the common cold. And none of us goes running or sequestering ourselves or anything of that nature. But it's one of three viral types that cause the common cold. Coronaviruses, rhinoviruses, and adenoviruses. <clears throat> the other group that we've always known about causes gastrointestinal infection. So there are gastrointestinal coronaviruses. Why this difference? Uh, we have these uh, strange things on our cells called receptors. They can either accept a signal or they can't. And the signal in some cases is a little protein on the surface of us. I always ask my students, uh, do you have a dog? If you do, do you have a uh, vaccinated for December? You go, of course. So, but why aren't you vaccinated? Because you don't have receptors for this type of virus. So you can't acquire it. So getting back to the coronaviruses, we've had these around for years. It was in 2003 that we got one variant of the coronaviruses that we call SARS. This is the um, severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome. That's what SARS stands for. Uh, we were fortunate in a way that SARS was transmitted apparently from animals to man. We call this a zoonotic reservoir. When a virus or bacterium is in uh, an animal population, we call that a zoonotic reservoir. That's where it normally exists. And only occasionally it comes into humans when we have contact. What we worry about is once that leap is made from animals to humans, can we transmit it from human to human? That's our real concern. And SARS could, but it was not tremendously good at it. And it's, to date, we've only had less than 10,000 cases of SARS worldwide. But it has a significant mortality rate. That means how many people die? So out of every 100 people, somewhere around 9.5%. It's 9.5%. Just under 10 people per 100 would die and get SARS. That was our first variant coronavirus. Uh, about nine or 10 years later, 
2012, we had a variant come out again from the zoonotic reservoir, but this time it wasn't, it was different, it was from camels. And it was transmitted solely from camels to man. It did not transmit well man to man. Uh, in fact, there's about only one case that was documented of human to human transplant. The reason you don't know about that one is called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And we're lucky it wasn't easily transmitted because that had a 35% mortality rate. 35 out of 100 people were dying. Now we have COVID-19. And COVID-19 is another coronavirus. It has jumped from animals to humans. And in this case, it has a very good efficiency going from human to human. Okay. So that's where we stand. Uh, we have this. In terms of the number of cases, if you want to know the latest number, put these up in the new report today. Uh, there have been 133,191 cases worldwide. Uh, with 4,951 4, deaths. That's a mortality rate of 3.7%. In the United States, we've had 1,215 cases as of noon today, with 36 deaths, and that's a 3% mortality rate. Six states have had no cases of COVID-19. And if you want to know, it's Alabama, Mississippi, West Virginia, North Dakota, Wyoming, and Idaho had no cases. Everyone else has had a few. The big outbreaks have been in Washington. That's the biggest outbreak, uh, primarily amongst nursing home residents. Uh, there are now 10 nursing homes that have been involved, um, and they have had uh, the vast majority of the deaths uh, in Washington City. The other two areas of outbreak are in California and in uh, southeastern state in Westchester County. Um, Dr. Roy was talking about the test that's being done. You hear conflicting statements. Administration officials say the test is wonderful and the test is available to everyone who wants it. The problem with that is the test is done by something called real-time PCR. It's a means of taking the genome of the virus and amplifying it up making many, many copies of it in a short period of time and being able to detect it. Uh, the instrumentation for that, low end, which most people would not use because it's one or two samples at a time, is about $20,000 just for the instrument. For laboratories, you're going to be doing large volumes of this, it's more than $100,000 just for the instrument. So not all labs are going to have this capability. So even if they were to get the kits, use them. And the kit does 800 tests. So when you hear about 1.5 million tests being available, divide that by 800, because that's how many panels are out there or kits are out there. And then divide that up only in laboratories that have the instrumentation. Once they receive the swabs, it only takes a few hours. This test is extremely rapid. We don't have to culture the virus. We don't do anything other than that uh, real-time PCR. The downside is that once you're diagnosed, there are no antivirals that work for you. People are always making the comparison, well, what about, why aren't we quarantining, quarantining people with flu? There's much more flu cases out there. Why aren't we quarantining them while we want to quarantine these individuals? Well, there are two reasons. The first is the mortality rate is very low. It's 0.1%. So, that's 35 times less than it is for COVID-19. The other reason is we have vaccines. We get immunized year to year. The cases we're seeing are primarily people who refuse to be immunized. So immunization really has a positive effect here. Uh, and then those people who do get influenza, there are a couple of antivirals that work to suppress the virus and shorten the disease. So we can work with that. We don't have it for COVID-19. There's not a vaccine, and vaccine studies will take usually take multiple years that they're being pushed, so they're going to take somewhere from 14 to 18 months to get completed. Uh, and currently, they haven't found an antiviral that works. 
Um, just so you have an idea about the structure and how it work, uh, how we can kind of work to disinfect. Um, coronaviruses are a group that have what we call an envelope around them. They, they put a membrane around their outside. So there's this fatty layer around the cell and it's got some protein spikes sticking out of it. This protein spikes are what allows them to attach to our cells. Because they have that fatty layer, they're very susceptible to things which disrupt membranes. So alcohol. Uh, that's why you can't find any pure oil or Germex or any of those products on the shelves right now, because they are uh, But just in your hands, it's also effective. And it's not what you use, but how long you scrub and dilute the virus off your hands. Excuse me. <clears throat> When it comes to survival on surfaces, I'm just talking about touching a surface and going to your face, uh, I got some numbers uh, from coronaviruses in general. We don't have enough COVID-19 information to say this is how long they survive. But if we're looking at coronaviruses in general, uh, at refrigerator temperatures, 4 degrees centigrade, which is about 39 Fahrenheit, they can last and survive and be infectious up to 28. However, we don't normally cough into our refrigerator. So uh, we have to look at it at higher temperatures. Uh, around here, we're coming around the year where we're going to be in the 80s and higher. And at between 30 and 40 C, which is 86 to 104 Fahrenheit, uh, that's much shorter. The other thing they need to survive is humidity. Um, if you have a humidity of 50%, rare here in Arizona. But we do get up to 30% during monsoon season or day like today. 30% uh, much shorter than 50%. Uh, the, at room temp, the estimates are for all coronaviruses together that they will um, last for about nine days on surfaces with no disinfection. So what do you do to disinfect surfaces? Uh, alcohol containing preps work extremely well as long as they're in contact with one thing. Similarly, if you make a dilution of Clorox, and that's about one part Clorox to 19 parts of water. So if you have a cup of Clorox, 19 cups of water, wipe it down, let it sit there for one minute, you will have a great reduction in the number of virus particles. Notice I did not say sterility, not say all were gone you'll get a big reduction. Uh, it's one of these problems that as you kill, you're always killing a percentage of the remaining virus that's there, and you're getting fewer and fewer people off. Uh, finally, some other things that can be used. Um, Benzalkonium chloride, uh, which is found in some preps uh, as well, uh, uh, can be used, again, as long as there's contact time. And finally, there's a product that those of you who have had children used to use for cleaning their heads and giving them a mask called chlorhexidine. Uh, it doesn't work at all. So that's a drown pulse. Your benzalkonium chloride, which is sort of spick and span type stuff, works extremely well. Okay, and I'll just stop there. So, John? I probably got the boring piece of the whole presentation here. These guys are fascinating uh, with their information. Uh, let me just explain my background a little bit. Because you might be wondering, administration of justice, what in the world does that have to do with all this science stuff? Uh, I began my career in police in 1977 in New Mexico. I worked in various capacities. Uh, went to Texas. What's well, great to state? A lot of new things in Texas. Ended up in Washington, D.C. One thing I discovered real quickly was in policing, uh, you might know a little bit about something, but all of a sudden something will happen. And you've got to educate yourself and learn a whole lot about stuff that you know nothing about. Uh, that, that was especially true in Washington, D.C. In the 2009 time period, I was working as what was called the Director of Academic Services. Uh, that was basically the, the director of our training complex and all activities and functions that went on there. 
Uh, the department is about 4,500 sworn and, and civilian employees, a uh, massive size agency, a uh, massive size training complex that we have, uh, probably about twice the size of this campus right here. It's huge. Uh, 2009 is important because uh, during that year we had the H1N1 influenza pandemic uh, that was declared. And our chief of police being proactive uh, saw fit to uh, established what we called a pandemic response team, a group of high-level executives in the department uh, to work on making a plan to be proactive, work on communication and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, my job being director of academic services was to focus on our training complex and activities that we had there. Uh, I had to assess our, our risks of the various uh, buildings that we had, the various activities that we had, and develop a plan and then implement procedures to ensure that we had a safe, clean, as clean as possible environment and that our workers and students were, were as safe and healthy as could be. Um, so I did that in 2009. A couple of years later, I was transferred to the chief's office and uh, you don't ever want to write a plan and just kind of leave it be and think that's the end of it. So the chief's office, I was working as the special assistant to the chief of police and she said, John, you know what? We need to revise and update our pandemic plan that we did a couple years ago. Uh, so this is in 2014, working as your special assistant at that time, um, my job had changed slightly. In this position, I was responsible for providing executive oversight on the plan, which was department-wide. So initially, my 2009 experience dealing with this was uh, looking at the academy, training functions, and what we need to do there. Uh, to accomplish our part of the plan in 2014, kind of looking at the bigger, broader issues department-wide, uh, which included worry about terrorism, worry about our jail facilities, worry about food service, all these other things that, that kind of came into play at that time. Uh, so let me focus on 2000. That kind of most resembles our college environment here. We have classes, we have people coming and going, we have instructors and staff. A uh, very dynamic kind of space organization, silly sometimes. Uh, I put together for the college some thoughts that, that I had, trying to kind of recreate uh, what we did back in 2009, uh, item by item. Uh, one area that we looked at was classrooms, because we know classrooms have a lot of people coming and going, potential for uh, germs being left behind. Staples, as Dr. Roy was just uh, explaining. Uh, so we looked at classrooms, we, we looked at how we can clean the classrooms, keep it coming and going, how often do you need to clean them, these sorts of things. Uh, I would get my information from the experts. Uh, our department had what was called a medical director, he was our expert. Uh, we had our own medical clinic, so uh, he was our expert in consultation with the D.C. Department of Health and the Center for Disease Control. Uh, so we would get information such as how do we need to clean the classrooms, uh, and bleach and water was the preferred solution for us, although I know that's not ideal in some environments because of the corrosive uh, nature that it may have. Uh, computer labs, what a nihilist area we have within the academy. Uh, and I think of this every time I'm in the classroom and I touch that keyboard at the podium there, and then I go to touch my phone. Yeah, I did this the other day, and then I pull out the sanitizer, and I wipe my hands. I'm thinking, I'm okay. I clean my hands from the keyboard. But what have I done in between? Touch my phone. I have like all kinds of germs on it. So I pull out another little thing from my backpack, a little wipe that I had, and I clean out my phone afterwards. But uh, that's what we did at the academy. We continue. Well, we made our, our plan written with things that we know, but we continually try to educate faculty, staff, students. What do they need to be thinking about? What do they constantly need to be doing? Uh, and I'm to a point now, I think, where every time I touch something or go someplace, I'm thinking, did I pick up germs or did I leave germs behind or how quickly do I need to wash my hands? And it's not that you're, you're paranoid. Uh, I think it's just it's probably just good cleaning that we should be doing every day of the week. Uh, but knowing that just making it more aware on the top of your mind helps. So classrooms was, was an area of concern. Computer labs was a, a really great area of concern because of the keyboards 
uh, open access computer labs and killer. We have people coming and going all the time. So uh, thinking about the keyboards. Restrooms were, were a concern for us. Uh, and I don't want anybody to raise any hands, guys in here. How many times have you gone to the restroom and you look and you see somebody go to the urinal and they just walk straight out? They don't wash their hands or do anything. I know I've seen it all the time. Uh, so we try two things. Our facility staff up to the cleaning of the restrooms and disinfecting the restrooms. But we also have an educational component of it, uh, which all instructors, even instructors, uh, faculty, and, and students, clean your hands, wash your hands for at least 20 seconds under the water before you go anywhere. Uh, we have an auditorium, uh, much larger than this auditorium, maybe two or three hundred seats. Uh, we have limited gatherings, large gatherings in that facility because we're afraid of close uh, uh, contact with each other, germs being spread. We had a gymnasium. We don't have a gymnasium on this campus, but I'll just share this with you. Our gymnasium, we, we put it in the category of kind of a high risk. High risk, that's what do you do when you're in the gym? You start breathing heavy, you start maybe drooling, occasionally stiff. You've ever been on basketball court, you see stuff on the floor. Uh, so our gymnasium was, was a high risk for uh, So we toned down uh, activities. That would be hand to hand combat, which maybe is irrelevant here, but even playing basketball. We cut off all the extracurricular stuff that is such as playing basketball. Any high risk activity where you might have saliva or germs spread to someplace else or the surface. Uh, we have a swimming pool, we increase its frequency on our chemical checks. The swimming pool, video production unit that we have, a group of about five or six people. We stopped outside filming from this crew and we said, just do whatever you got to do in house. Uh, stay in your little room upstairs with all your video equipment and edit stuff or do whatever you can do. For the next period of four to six weeks or whatever it was, until we're sure that the threat is over and then you can go out and start filming again. Uh, so, in that respect, we're just trying to minimize the amount of contact that people would have had and the potential for them contacting somebody, bringing back that uh, virus, and then wiping out all of the students and staff at the academy. Uh, miscellaneous things that we did, we had CPR training with. with if you've ever done that, you know how you do the mouth to mouth. Uh, we temporarily modified that so we wouldn't have that, even though our structures are fabulous at cleaning the dummies afterwards. We just felt the risk was a little bit high and they just still might have it or something left on that dummy. Uh, we temporarily stopped uh, all academy uh, visits. We had guests and visitors that would like to come to the academy. So we temporarily stopped that. If it wasn't absolutely necessary, we just stopped doing it. Uh, and it seemed to work out well. We didn't have any any serious issues. Uh, our goal was trying to be proactive, trying to prevent the spread of anything that may have been out there. And at that time, the H1N1 was our, our concern. Uh, and then we also, as part of this pandemic plan that we did, we assigned certain roles to individuals. Uh, we had instructional staff responsible for certain things, support staff responsible for certain things, information technology, taking care of the laptops and computers, cleaning them, uh, facilities, uh, cleaning the at the end of the day, the medical director I mentioned, information technology, or public information officer getting out. Uh, our goal there was to make sure that we got the information out in a quick, timely manner uh, to everyone. Because uh, you hear the word pandemic and all of a sudden fear strikes you. Uh, so our goal was to let everybody know we're, we're trying to look out for safety, your health, and this is what we're doing. And then presented uh, some of the expert opinions and advice like our fellows are doing here. Uh, so that's what I did in 2009. About a week ago, I shared with our Director of Academic uh, Affairs, the Office of Academic Affairs, our Vice President, uh, 